All right, so welcome back to The Young Idealist and my ongoing series on classical German philosophy, German idealism, romanticism, and Jewish thought. Today, I brought in a very special friend of mine um, who's a colleague um, at York University. Um, and we're going to be talking about an intersecting figure that is gaining a lot of popularity um, recently. Um, we're going to talk about Charles Saunders Peirce. Um, and I've asked my good friend, Eric Tate, who is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Humanities at York University. And also you may recognize him from the Plastic Pills Pill Pod. So Eric is currently working on a dissertation on semiotics and Charles Sanders' purse. And he's maneuvering through or navigating through Peirce's philosophy and I thought it would be wonderful to have an introductory kind of informal discussion on who is Peirce, why is Peirce important, and a little tidbits about his concepts. So thank you for being here, Eric. I'm really happy to have you on our show, my show, finally. Thanks for inviting me. Hi, hi, Chris. <laughs> hi, everybody. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, I, I think this is going to be fun. Um, we're good friends, so, you know, and I think a lot of people can learn a lot of, um, a lot of stuff from you. I think you're, you're very articulate, you're well-spoken, and I think when you speak about Peirce, you really bring him to life. So I was wondering, maybe we can start off with who was Peirce, and why do you think we should return to his philosophy? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Thanks for that. Actually, you, you've you've never had anybody on here talk about Peirce before, have you? No, I've I've actually never had anybody on here to speak about Peirce. This you're the first person, actually. Cool, cool. Well, this is perfect because we missed our uh, bar night this week too because of uh, reading break. So we we get to have a have a virtual parasocial chat. Cool. True. It's very <laughs> true. Okay, who was he? Why should we return to his philosophy? Well, I think most people would know Peirce as an American philosopher who's part of the pragmatist tradition, somebody who really kind of coined the term pragmatism, according to William James, another contemporary of Peirce's. Uh, yeah, Peirce was a pragmatist philosopher. You might know him also as a semiotician. He is... He independently founded semiotics um, before Saussure, and maybe at the same time, maybe a bit before. Um, and a logician. I mean, he was a lot of things, right? He's he was a polymath. He was a genius. I mean, the list goes on and on of fields, mainly in the sciences and the human sciences, like human sciences is in you know, psychology and experimental psychology. Um, but also he studied history, but also, yeah, mathematician. He was trained as a chemist. He, uh, he was, his, his father was one of the greatest mathematicians of his day. So he, he had a, a very strict mathematical training yeah, he's he, and he's a pretty complicated guy. I mean, getting into his life story and who he was is is one thing, right? He's a very tragic figure. He um, spent a lot of his life, you know, trying to establish himself in the budding academia of the time uh, with very little success. He he also made some some pretty important enemies and was kind of a a difficult guy to deal with as well. Um, one of his biographers thought he was kind of like manic depressive. And so he would go through periods of intense activity and then he would have these big crashes and also like facial neuralgia. He had horrible problems with, um, yeah, this painful, this condition where you have this unbearable pain in your face and um, it freezes up. And he ended up becoming a very good, uh, very good um, at doing drugs as a result of that. He, he was probably an addict by the time he was 40 or 50, but he kind of lived his life through using cocktails of drugs to get him through the pain. Yeah, I mean, who he was, very tragic figure, died 
and poverty and relative obscurity. Um, yeah, I mean, we can talk more about that as, as we go along. I don't have to spill it all right now, but then... I mean, returning, why should we return to his philosophy? I mean, I think he was he was a philosopher, among other things, right? He worked on the history of philosophy. He broke one of the cardinal rules of his time, and he, he read the scholastics. He read the medieval scholastics. He was proficient in Latin and, and probably ancient Greek as well and other languages, so he went back in time and he read all the he read all the important philosophers right down to his day, including Descartes and Locke and Hume and Leibniz. And he was he started off his philosophical life as a Kant as a Kantian. Yeah, he he claimed to have had the critique of pure reason memorized. Uh, but he eventually sort of moved beyond he never left Kant behind but he moved beyond Kantian philosophy and developed his own system and I guess the short answer to that is is it is it is startling and original and comprehensive and important enough to deserve probably a place among the canonical systems of philosophy like Aristotle's or I mean like Hegel's kind of system of philosophy you could have you know Purse's system as well as something that's original and striking and and different enough to deserve close study and it it's getting that <laughs> it's getting that now it's he's getting a lot more attention than he has in the, over the twentieth century. Now I know you've gone over uh, um, some of his life, but do you think there are any main events epochs in his life that kind of led him to to this philosophical path or? Um, I know we've talked before about the the piles upon piles of written manuscripts in the basement of Harvard or something like that. So, what was he what was he like during his life? Um, um, where did he often write? You know these manuscripts. Um, sorry, these are random questions. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, he's um, well. I guess a major event in everyone's life is is being born. That's a good one to start with. Yeah, he was born in uh, 1839 in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So in the area of of, of New England and, and Harvard and all that. Um, yeah, and in the, in the spooky country where every all the horror stories in America seem to take place, <laughs> like uh, Edgar Allan Poe and I think Stephen King said a lot of his stories there. I think H.P. Lovecraft was from around there too anyway that's besides the point uh yeah he, he was born in 1839 i think one of i mean for his intellectual development he'll always say reading this his brother left this logic textbook lying around by someone named richard waitley and so he read through this he just fell upon it and read through it and read very very carefully this sort of almost standard kind of logic textbook of the day and and he taught himself logic that way and that and he said from that point on he he couldn't come to any question without viewing it through the lens of of logic which he also made enormous contributions to throughout his life so yeah if you were to pick all the things he was i mean he was trained as a chem his formal training was in chemistry but you know, he was a logician, probably first and foremost. And he had his mathematical training, like I said, from his dad, who was probably Benjamin Peirce, who was probably the foremost mathematician in America at the time. Uh, Peirce was really promising. He showed a lot of skill. He might have been even better than his dad eventually at math. And, and he was probably the greatest logician in the world at his time. At, at his at his peak he independently of frega and a little bit maybe a little bit later but independently of frega discovered logical logical quantifiers so when you have like um the existential quantifier and the and the universal quantifier that comes from purse and actually the notation we use from that is is derived from purse's notation that he came up with you know hillary, hillary putnam would 
read Peirce and say, I'm so surprised how Peirce has touched so many areas of logic. And yet he's still, he's such an obscure figure still. I mean, he, yeah, he, he got in with Kantianism quite young as well. Maybe in the 1860s, he started to read Kant and he was really taken with German philosophy. But he found, you know, this is where he gets that idea from, right? Because Kant's critique of pure reason, Kant's project is to kind of use logic to clear metaphysics of its detritus and its dogmatism and and all of this kind of, you know, he he wants to sort of almost refound the project of metaphysics on on logic, right? I guess maybe that's a decent way to think about Kant, but for Peirce, the problem was like logic was in a terrible condition at the time. And Kant was right, like really intuitively good at logic, intuitively brilliant. But he thought that Aristotelian logic was basically that's it. Like logic had been completed, almost like Euclidean geometry from Euclid, completed, good, ready to go. Aristotle logic, complete, good, ready to go. Peirce completely disagreed with that. Uh, and yeah, so I mean, the, the time Kant was writing, logic was it? So almost that's that's one of the ways you can think about why Peirce moved beyond Kant is because Peirce, you know, besides discovering quantifiers, he made all kinds of different improvements and additions to logic over his life, and and he had to then sort of update epistemology and update metaphysics as a result of that, right? Because if you're going to base metaphysics on logic, then you have to keep, you know, metaphysics in step with logical discoveries. Yeah, yeah. And soon after reading Kant, he reads the Scholastics, and he discovers like a wealth of of very subtle logical thinking, especially in in Duns Scotus, but he reads he reads widely and deeply in the history of philosophy, and he gravitates towards Duns Scotus and declares himself a, a scholastic realist, and that's the position he sort of lands on in the late sixties, and he maintains realism, although you know, the the big struggle for him wasn't realism and idealism or materialism and idealism. It was realism and nominalism. He thought that was the defining opposition in, in, in philosophy and that nominalism had kind of taken hold and everybody was a nominalist. And he was trying to like break, he was trying to break away from this trend and he declared himself a realist and Scholars kind of argue, how idealist was he? Was he more idealist when he was older? Or was he kind of a, a realist right from the beginning? How compatible are these different parts? Because like I said, Peirce is a complicated guy. His philosophy so has lots just, of different just, parts. Just for some of the viewers that don't know this, how would you define nominalism? Oof. Well, I can uh, read one of Peirce's... Uh, <laughs> definitions of nominalism he says nominalism is quote uh this is from the century dictionary so first first would write a lot of dictionary entries partly to get his ideas out there partly to just make money because he was always struggling he wasn't very good with money um but that's 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 another dynamic <laughs> yeah so nominalism is quote the doctrine that nothing is general but names. More specifically, the doctrine that common nouns as man, horse, represent in their generality nothing in the real things, but mere conveniences for speaking of many things at once, or at most necessities of human thought. Individualism, that's the last word. <laughs> end quote. If it's individualism, he sees nominalism and individualism as sort of fun foundationally connected. So things, if you're a nominalist, you'll probably be an individualist. It just kind of results from that philosophy. That's why it's kind of funny. It just ends with <laughs> semicolon individualism. But well, yeah, yeah. So it, it's uh it's that's complicated, but yeah, basically, you know, when I say, you know, you're a human and I'm a human. It's just a convenience for speaking about two individuals who really have nothing in common. Like your humanity 
is individually your humanity and has nothing to do with my humanity, which is individually my humanity. There's no, there's no real commonality between us as individuals. Think of it that way. So it's just a name, nominalism, nameism. That's a, well, thank you for the definition. Thank you for the reading, uh, the, the kind of paragraph or the blurb from, from Peirce that really brought a definition to life. And I think you've done a really great job of articulating and navigating through Peirce's life and talking about some of the tragic events and talking about some of his, his influences. And, and I know you brought up SCOTUS and Kant, but if you were to, if you were to be asked, what do you think, or who do you think Peirce's main philosophical influences were, who in your who do you think um, best influenced him and in his, I guess, his whole oeuvre for, for as long as he was writing? Oh, yeah. Kant, Aristotle, Scotus, probably be the big ones. Maybe Leibniz would be another one. H historically, he, he was influenced by a lot of his contemporaries, too, like Josiah Royce, William James, uh, John Dewey was one of his students, but but maybe John Dewey was more influenced by Peirce than Peirce was by John Dewey. Dewey's a bit younger. Um, yeah, contemporaries, but then there's loads, you know, you could point out loads and loads of minor influences as well on the side, but I think, you know, like Schelling, Hegel, Peirce read them, Peirce was familiar with them to varying degrees. I'm not sure when he became familiar with them. That's a different question, but he was. And uh, yeah, probably Kant, Aristotle, Scotus would be maybe his biggest historical influences in philosophy. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, did you have anything else that you wanted to say or do you want me to move to the next question? I mean, things will keep coming back. There's a, there's a lot to say about that sort of stuff. His his philosophical influences were varied, and he saw the history of philosophy as as extremely relevant to his project. So he frequently his project being to almost build like a system. So I mean, if you just say the way he was influenced by you know Kant, he he took the idea of architectonics from Kant, right? So building a systematic philosophy, having these sort of foundational architectonic principles. Um, I'm just looking at the at, at the questions you said you might ask, so I don't ruin anything ahead of time. No, 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 no. You're doing you're doing this is fantastic. Actually, I was wondering um, yeah, because yeah, you we move to the next question, then I'll talk. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. You're doing this is this is fantastic. I. Because of our discussions, you know, at, at York and on campus, I was wondering if maybe we can talk about um, his kind of scholastic realism and, and this influence on his on his thinking. Because I know we've talked about some of these obscure figures in the scholastic tra tradition that have that were influences on Peirce. So in terms of his scholastic realism, and I know you've already brought up SCOTUS, are there any other thinkers or how did he apply this? Um, to his philosophical system. Sorry, that might be mm -hmm. a big question. <laughs> no, it's good. I've been reading a little bit about his like realism and scholastic realism lately, trying to get a handle on it. Um, yeah, realism, realism and nominalism, I guess I should have mentioned already, uh, the big thing between realists and nominalists is the status of universals. Right. So that goes back to what I was saying, like, you know, the words man or the word horse, right? Those are, you know, common nouns, or you might call them class names, right? They're, they name a class of, of individual beings or things you could go out and find that are called horse, <laughs> for example. The question is, well, is there anything, you know, like what SCOTUS would call a common nature? Is the common nature between man and horse just because they strike us with, as similar? Or is there some real similarity between the individuals that we would slot into these classes? So like I said with us, like hu humanity, we share that. Is there anything real or is that just a name convenience to, you know, 
the collection, like set theory, <laughs> just the collection of humans, but otherwise it's just a word and there's nothing really similar between us. Yeah, well, he think. I mean, maybe that's a bit unfair to nominalists, but that's how he kind of views the controversy of nominalism versus realism is over universals. So SCOTUS, realist, actually, according to person, moderate realist, but he was a realist, and um, he believed that universals had real being independently of what the mind thinks about those things. So they're not fully determined by thought. Whereas someone like Willem of Ockham, who's kind of the arch nominalist of the scholastic tradition, uh, Ockham would deny the reality of universals, say that you're just, you know, multiplying entities, uh, that's your system is, is not very economical. Your, your philosophical system has too much going on. We can pare it down. We don't need real universals to explain things. So that's, and, and Peirce was always kind of, you know, he, he declared himself a realist, but he always took the controversy seriously. He was never dismissive of the nominalists, but he did have some pretty negative things to say about nominalism, especially when it came to scientific practice, what he saw as good science and, and what kind of methods scientists should adopt. He thought nominalism was a bit problematic in that regard. But um, you can also find passages where he's pretty, you know, charitable towards the difference between realists and nominalists. But yeah, Scotus would have been a major influence in that realism, right? Realism towards universals, believing that, you know, there's a common nature between us. He did this experiment where he would say, you know, I'm holding a rock. And how, how do I know that when I remove my hand, this rock is going to fall because there's sort of a real habit or a real law influencing this rock, right? And so I'm not making this prediction. Obviously, the prediction is correct, but it's not because I am a clairvoyant. It's not because I can see into the future. It's because I think that these laws are real and they really influence events. So event removing hand event rock falls right it's not a, you're not seeing the future you just understand the reality of the laws of say physics in this case or you know the the story i don't know if it's true about kant every single day he would you know go on the walk at the same time you could set your watch to him he was so regular right is there a real habit influencing kant's behavior <laughs> i mean the realist would say yes there is there's a real habit and I could predict the next day that I would see Kant at the same time, and, you know, every day, same thing. I don't know if that's, it's a, maybe that's a bit of a, a legend around Kant, but if the point is this is what it demonstrates, I guess. Yeah. No, I think you, I think you did a really good job of, of answering uh, the question and of giving us a great, ex giving us great examples. If, what would you say are Peirce's main um, philosophical concepts and, and how did he employ them through his system? Oof. See, this is this is where it starts to get really difficult with Peirce because I, I guess I've mentioned a couple already, pragmatism, scholastic realism, but there's a lot of concepts that go along with them. Maybe, uh, maybe we can maybe we can just um, talk about firstness, secondness, and thirdness. I know we've we've discussed this before. Maybe we can just uh, just talk about that as opposed to opening up a huge can of worms here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, let's see. Yeah. So realism would be important, and that links to his theory of categories, right? So. Yeah, Peirce had these three basic categories. He, he developed them, I mean, probably as early as, as the 19, 1860s. You can see him thinking about these fundamental categories. In the, in the beginning, he called them what quality, relation, representation. He thought there was three categories. 
and then remember these are these are like fundamental basic categories that it, that everything can be sort of boiled down to and yeah eventually you know they're called firstness secondness and thirdness so firstness would correspond to quality secondness would correspond to relation or or reaction between two things secondness and then thirdness would be representation or even mediation so you know bringing a first and a second together you could think you know if the first is the beginning and the second is the end the third is what connects them is the pathway between them for example i mean he has so many different ways of talking about these because they are the most general part when i mentioned architectonics and, and laying the foundations for a philosophical system like these are the foundations they are broad and they are deep and they cover lots and lots of different things he has very very different ways of talking about these depending on whether he's in a phenomenological register whether he's speaking in a in a semiotic register whether he's speaking in a metaphysical register like whatever part of the system he develop is developing in that paper you might be reading of verses that's how he'll talk about firstness secondness and thirdness within that context so they kind of they and and the reason kind of why everything appears in threes in his uh, in his philosophy quite often so you know you have say going back to aristotle right you have aristotle's categories you have substance and accident and then all the different sort of categories of accidents right so wait, wait you get 10 from aristotle maybe and then eventually you go up to Kant, right? And Kant has his 12 categories, which correspond to a table of judgments. And, and interestingly, Kant kind of has four groupings. And then within these four, quantity, quality, modality, and, and relation, is that it? Yes, <laughs> and, yes. Yeah, and then, and then within each of those, you have three. So three, six, nine, twelve. You have twelve categories in, with Kant. Um, so Peirce's categories, you can think of it almost as like in that tradition, except Peirce just wants three. He wants to boil it down to three. He says, yeah, "Look, even Kant has sort of three categories. He has three entries in each of the four. <laughs> so you know, maybe maybe there's like a short list of categories, firstness, secondness, and thirdness, and then we could think of like a long list of categories. So like what Hegel does in the science of logic, right? He go, he has the general division, which is into three, but then he has, but then within each book, it's a string of, of you know, different categories. It's a long list at that point. And so what are the first, and then they come in threes as well, right? Like being nothing and becoming. And then you go on to the next sort of in the list and, and then the next one, then the next one. And then, and then you go to the next section, essence, right? being essence and idea. Those are, I guess those are the three distinctions, the three main divisions. So you have, so Hegel is kind of sometimes thought of as a triadic philosopher as well because he has a lot of it falls into threes so so purses purse sees this later on and thinks like wow i've kind of arrived at this insight myself as well it must be kind of correct hegel's sort of almost confirming this for me that it's great to have these sort of three basic categories and even like Husserl later kind of has almost a categorical thing going on as well, but I'm not as familiar with that. And and not many people have really addressed categorical kinds of origins of philosophy. So yeah, it really comes through Kant and Aristotle and Hegel and then those three categories of purses. He sees them as part of that tradition. I, don't, I think maybe eventually he sees them as that part of of that part part of that tradition well thank you for that that was I, you're doing a really good job of illuminating these concepts kind of bringing them to life for um the viewers um 
I, I this is going to be a difficult question because I know uh, Purse's work. Purse doesn't really have one specific work. He has multiple works. Um, but what are Purse's main works? If you if you if you had to name a couple, and if someone was interested in Purse's philosophy, where where would they actually begin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, that's uh, yeah. We were discussing this before, and this is a really tough. Purse had a lot of ideas for books and publications, um, but he never really did what a lot of philosophers do and, you know, publish a book or a series of books that, like, outlines their views. He doesn't have his three critiques, right? He doesn't have his, he doesn't have his main publication, his, his Summa Persiana or anything like that, right? That just summarizes his views because of his difficult life and his problems with working with people. And, and, and I mean, there's a lot of different reasons for it, but yeah, he never, but there's no, there's no shortage of, of book ideas you can find. So, yeah, I mean, it, I'll start with the other thing first. If, if you really want to start reading purse, like a good entry point, is to buy the or to, to read the essential purse it's called there's a, there's two volumes of the essential purse uh they were published in the 90s by great purse scholars and um volume one and two so volume one covers 1867 to 1893 and then the the next one picks up from there 1893 and goes almost to the end of his life so Peirce dies in 1914, um, just on the eve of World War One. So, and and reading the the intro, the amazing introductions in in the in the essential Peirce volumes is a great way to you know get oriented in Peirce's life. There's also one of you know those that guide for the perplexed series. There's a, there's one of those that's a good one too. By I think his name is Cornelius De Wall. Uh, wrote that um, purse, a guide for the perplexed. That's a good. That's another good intro text uh, to go to if you want an introduction for purse. Broadly, broad introductions, right? Mostly, probably oriented mostly to his philosophy. Um, I mean, his works, right? Are gathered in the collected papers. So there's this eight volume collection that started being published about 20 years after he died so imagine that he dies there's nothing on him for 20 years except a couple collections of his work you know some of his papers and letters were being circulated like um victoria lady welby someone he corresponded with in in britain uh she circulated some of his let things on semiotics um so they found their way into a book by Ogden and Richards called The Meaning of Meaning. Some of these letters got published there and, and they they kind of summarized and riffed on some of Peirce's ideas in semiotics, for instance. But really, until the collected papers start coming out 20 years after Peirce dies, so in the 1930s, and then for the next 10 or 15 years, these are being published, eight volumes. Um, a heroic publication effort by, I think their names were Paul, Paul Wace and Charles Hartzorn. Um, Charles Hartzorn was a student of Alfred Whitehead's, I believe. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, you know, you can get that online uh, in, in like critical editions websites and things. You can find that. And Carolyn Iselli, I think that's how you pronounce it, published a uh, bunch of Peirce's mathematical works under the new elements of mathematics. Uh, an early text that's good to pick up is by Eustace Buchler. Uh, has some of Peirce's philosophy and semiotic writings. Um, yeah, those are places to go to get his, you know, original works. But again, like, 
and then, and then of course there's the writings of Charles Peirce, which is projected to be 30 volumes. <laughs> this guy wrote like a hundred, maybe over a hundred thousand handwritten manuscript pages. So there's going to be maybe 30 volumes plus, uh, plus all of his dictionary entries and things like that. This guy was extraordinarily prolific. Um, so we're at volume eight right now. <laughs> we got a ways to go still. Wow. Uh, it's a, but yeah, I think, you know, for people to actually break into the world of purse, yeah, the essential purse kind of distills some of his main articles, mostly leaning towards his philosophy. So, you know, one of his really, really important ones is on a new list of categories. As I was talking, all that explanation about categories I was giving. Yeah. In 1868, he publishes on a new list of categories which which is where he sets out first these these actually there's kind of five categories we strangely but two of them drop away eventually uh and then yeah you know the essential purse is really like a lot of it is essential right a lot of it is is really crucial for understanding purse's main positions on things so after that new list of categories is um a series he writes for the Journal of Speculative Philosophy, and that's his sort of anti-Cartesianism, or sometimes it's called his cognition series. And that's where he puts out his anti-Cartesian position in Cartesian and, and weirdly Platonic nominalism. He argues against these sorts of philosophical perspectives, and, and you can sort of see the seeds of pragmatism and realism coming into play there. But really, you get pragmatism in, in his, um, a lot of people, if you've read into philosophy, you've probably read The Fixation of Belief and How to Make Our Ideas Clear. Uh, there's Those are the first two of a series of papers he publishes in Popular Mechanics, so kind of for a popular audience. And those those are, you know, a distillation of Peirce's thinking since the uh, New List of Categories papers and a distillation of what he'd been talking about in something called the Metaphysical Club <laughs> that uh, he was in with uh, William James and uh, Chauncey Wright and, uh, and, and some, some other big philosophers of the day in the 1870s. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think, I, I think you've given us... Yeah, no, totally. You've given us a lot um, to really sink our teeth into. Um, and, and half, you know, half of my series is not just getting to know the the philosopher, but also getting to know the scholar. Um, and so I was wondering, you know, for the rest of our viewers, especially some of the viewers that are going to be watching this from the plastic pill side as well, um, how were you introduced to Peirce's philosophy and, and how do you employ Peirce's own system in your in your dissertation or your scholarly work? Oh, I, I came to Peirce through semiotics. So being in being in a, a more humanities oriented disciplines, uh, I was taught Saussure and, and the whole structuralist, post-structuralist tradition. And uh, I just, I one of my professors sort of made this offhand comment, I guess, saying, you know, I'm going to teach, this course is based on Saussure, and Saussure is very important for, you know, French theory, and this is the sort of stuff you're going to learn about. But there's this other guy <laughs> named Charles Peirce, and and he, he, in many ways, he developed this, this enormous and difficult semiotic system. So I went through the paces and I learned Saussure and Saussurean linguistics and, and and I did the proper sort of humanities stuff there. But I, liking a challenge, I took a peek at Peirce and it just kind of blew me away. And so that's sort of how I got in. That was early on. And yeah, I got, Peirce just blew me away. Also super difficult, such a long learning curve to really get into purses you know, the, there's many in many ways so sir is much more expedient than purse because so sir's 
you know, he has this bipartite sign. I'm not saying it's easy. So Sir is difficult as well. And track tracing what later people like, you know, Claude Levi Strauss and Roland Barthes and Jacques Derrida and what they all how they all engage with Saussure. You gotta be very precise and 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 try not to simplify it. But in many ways, Purse was just so different and so it felt less less trodden. I mean, he described himself as a backwoodsman clearing the way for future semioticians. He knew he would never and that that's still how it feels, even though there's tons of great books like you know, James Liska, David Savin, T.L. Short. Those are the names of some scholars who have released big books on Peirce's semiotics now. So there's, it's getting saturated, but I, yeah, I came into it through semiotics and, and me being the way I am, I like to, I like a variety of topics. So Peirce is perfect, right? He's, he's always, he's got so many different dimensions. If I, I feel like learning a bit of like, formal logic today i can go there i feel like learning a bit about chemistry or math i can go there or history and philosophy i can go there too it's it's nice you go in all these different directions i kind of have academic adhd as well as real adhd i'm not using that as a metaphor it's real <laughs> but yeah purse, purse is good for that kind of thing well so, we are at the the 45 minute mark and you've answered all my questions and you've navigated us through Peirce's life, um, his his main works, a lot of his concepts, even secondary scholarship on it. So uh, you really brought him to life. So I want to thank you for that and um, can't wait to post this. I, I think you really did a really good job of articulating Peirce and your love for Peirce. And um, thank you so much for, for being here and participating in my series. Well, Thanks for the opportunity. I I hope it is clear. I mean, it is both of the introductions in the essential purse say this. It's like it's impossible to give you anything but a really, really, you know, low quality thumbnail sketch of purse's <laughs> life and his philosophy. It would take hours and hours and, and it would take a long time. So I, I hope some of this was intelligible and interesting. And even if you just go look at Purse's, you know, if you want to get into his um, semiotics, pick up the Essential Purse Volume 2 and read what is a sign and then take it from there. Like, that's a good way in. But that's, I, hope, that's... I hope it was intelligible. No, 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 it was super intelligible. And I think the, the last comment about um, reading the, the work on the sign is great. Uh, and thank you so much.